Hi. Welcome. Um, just have a little intro. This is actually going to be... <laughs> Maybe it won't be. A little interruption there. Um, it'll probably happen again. We'll see. Um, I'm thinking that aliens affected the minds of the wheat artists who make crop circles. And that is to say that crop circles are still made by aliens. It's just that the artists are tuned into the communications with aliens without their knowing they're tuned into it. And by aliens, I mean higher dimensional intelligence, a granting agency to outwardness. This could be said to be the genius or genie of the artist, the openness and reopenness of artwork displayed regardless of the artist's knowing of the grand communion. For example, of the crop circles is not not argument, is a not not argument about whether aliens created the crop circles or not. But it cannot be proved that all crop circles were made by the handiwork of man. That is but a mere rational argument to put a pragmatic mind at ease and comfort. For the mind that seeks basic comforts and maintenance as it fears the perimeter, this mind fears sufferability as a peripheral opposition to comfort. These minds stand at the center of their mind's greatest practical conception to state the pragmatic reasonability of crop circles being made merely by man. As far as conception of the universe for Cox, the commenter Cox, or Coax, I think that there is orderliness in the universe, a sort of objective logical form that needs someone to perceive this logical form as orderliness. Yet beyond just perceiving logical form, the connectivity of the conscious perceiver to the logical form is a new dimension of the universe. And if this connectivity feeds something intelligent into the perceiver, then one can say that the universe is speaking to them. I consider these tertiary dimensions of conception to be appropriately called a spiritual space, as the conception itself resides between and separate from empiricism and pragmatism. If a rainbow occurs at all, it requires a perceiver or an eye of sorts to exist as an element of existence. Yet the elements that make up the rainbow are just the right orderliness of the universe. Yet it is our taste to enjoy the rare situation with difference that makes seeing a rainbow formally rare, and hence with a sense of nostalgic magic. One could call seeing a rainbow while thinking a lofty thought may endure, endear the coincidental thought with a mystical overtone. Let me say that one again. One could call seeing a rainbow while thinking of a lofty thought Oh, I must have my grammar must be off on that sentence. May endure oh one who could see a rainbow while thinking a lofty thought may endear the coincidental thought with a mystical overtone. I just typed these up a few minutes before I'm making this video. This rarity that requires a viewer sensing a phenomenon from within a rational space compares the coincidence with rain, which is pragmatic, with a conceptual mystical overtone, binds the empirical with the mystical, and this binding appears to many as spiritual. Yet this is a matter of fact view. If one senses a coincidence with mind and the rarity of rainbows and recycles and re-listens to their thoughts right then and there, then compares this recycling to correspond to the next empirical symbolic occurrence, one might find a message in the seemingly unrelated onslaught of symbols. In other words, one might find a language within the mundane. If one does find meaning throughout the onslaught of symbols as it is accented by the rarity of a rainbow and follows this message, 
one opens themselves up to finding further meaning, doubling of patterns as lingual thoughts. One might say that the universe is speaking to them. This happening is self-evident and evidence is intelligent agency residing in nature. I call this mental allowance a spiritual embodiment. This is much grander than mere mundane meanings with one's environment. Piro and I have differing views on exactly this point, as Piro's point is always towards the creation of meaning as we feel ourselves as separate from one symbolic environment, and hence finds and creates meaning where, as I am about all of that, as well as including a gathering and intersecting of meaning and meaning symbolic patterns that run within adjacently, that run within adjacently within both one's mind and one's environment as a certain recognition that the external internal dichotomy collapses via deconstruction into a monad of exteriority complete mental transparency as it is here at these moments of madness that one finds an intelligence in the universe which lays as a rays of interactive meaning with the intelligent node who is just recognized if not God, then a higher power. Consider the brain as an antenna opposed to a conjurer. Anyway. So, that's the um, beginning of the pain philosophy. So I wanted to kind of work on this abstract a little bit more. Um, while I talk, yeah, I'm, I think that there's a, a direct disconnect between um, Piro's notion of intelligence, or not intelligence, but kind of an intuitive uh, spiritualism, and my own, because mine mine requires and not only the attempt towards finding symbolism, meaningful symbolism in a supposedly unintelligent universe to find intelligence in the seemingly unintelligent universe. Where Piro, I don't believe, he, he, he grants over that as an idea, but he doesn't, he doesn't, he, he hasn't experienced it, so I don't think I still say that that Piro is on the inside of a covalence, uh, of a first order covalence, where I feel the universe is working with a multitude of covalences. And by covalence, I mean the exteriority of our environment. Let's see how I'm going to do this. Boom, boom. Oh, right there. That. Ooh, shit. <laughs> Let's do that right there instead. It's kind of white on white, so it's probably hard for the viewer to see. That was like the last part of the, the painting that I wanted to state. Oh yeah, I wanted to speak about my conversation with Piro a little bit too. <laughs> That's probably the shortest painting philosophy video that I'll have up is this one. Because that's all the more painting I wanted to do on that abstract. At least for the time being. That's the completeness of the of the painting. 
I don't know, I might paint more blue on. Let me paint more blue on over here. Um, yeah, my conversation with Piro, I thought, you know, I maintained a tone and a respect for Piro, regardless of whatever his, you know, his personal, you know, fears about how he came across while drinking. Um, I personally was hoping that he wouldn't use it as a case to stop drinking or anything of the sort. Because the thing about Piro is that he maintained logical form and coherence throughout the whole thing, regardless of a bottle of scotch or not. He maintained coherence. And that maintenance showed some huge endurance on his part. The fact that he's, you know, he's like an unbreakable machine of keeping, keeping his sense, his sense together. <laughs> Even though I advocate double speak in one's own mind and kind of a running into a certain senselessness as a, a preparation to be open to the universe for any, any signs of symbolic meaning or happenings that may take on a meaningful, intelligible role in the mind of the, the person listening, namely myself. But my hope is still to find somebody else that says they, they have read patterns in the clouds or they read patterns in in nature's trail and it's taken on symbolic and meaningful form for them and the, the dichotomy the internal external dichotomy of one symbol system as it relates to let's say seeing a rainbow and then saying rainbow in the mind as a symbol that those two collapse into just the idea of rainbow and then without a connectivity to the next bit of pragmatism, the next symbol comes into play and lines up into kind of a Sherlock Holmes detective uh, book that, that starts unreve revealing a mystery, kind of a, a higher powers mystery for the individual. You know, the atheist manifesto would state that no such thing as a pragmatic environmental occurrence um, could, you know, have uh, meaning in and of itself outside of the person granting it meaning. And kind of like the rainbow, the, the viewer, the eye of the rainbow is as important of a component as the molecular structure of the rainbow for seeing a rainbow, for seeing a disarray of light or an array of light as opposed to a disarray of light. It takes a consciousness or a lens, someone apprehending it. It's like if the tree falls in the forest, does not make a sound? Well... It makes vibration, but what we call sound includes an ear. And so I say that it doesn't make a sound, uh, doesn't make a noise. Well, if you just think noise is vibration without an ear, then, then you could go that way on that argument. Anyway, so this is more of my spiritualism. Um, my spiritualism isn't just uh, an intending... Uh, a reaching towards and finding meaning in the universe. It's a finding meaning in the universe that asks something of you that you can correspond with, a correspondence meaning. And perhaps, and I think I'm using it differently than, than other people speak of correspondence meaning, because I think they're speaking of two, two speakers instead of a speaker and the speaker's symbolic environment. Anyway, 
this this kind of double speak that goes on the mind that lays over the pragmatism, the ground, and then also grants like like you could type two paragraphs at the same time, and one of them is going to be a pragmatic, evolutionary, gravity-oriented, um, empirical paragraph, and the other one is going to be an instructive response, um, a collaborative, interactive message in the in the other paragraph, and that that double speak goes through concurrently with one's engagement towards meaning. Um, I don't know if I just got to, but oh, what I was going to say is that this, this double speak and this granting over oneself to the sensibility of an intelligent universe, speaking back, speaking in communion with them, like people say they have conversations with God, or me declaring you know, exposing to people that I pray, it's, it's, the prayer isn't necessarily a communion as much as it is a finding meaning, but at points when I'm in this radical, what I call a correspondence phase with the universe, uh, a prayer is as interactive as any other thought because all of your thoughts are transparent, transparent to the universe, that there is an exteriority of the deconstruction between an internal monologue and an external symbolic environment. Anyway, I was going to say that in order to get to this level and breach, breach the pragmatic paragraph that one's writing about their environment, one has to go through a duplicity and a, a, it appears to be elusive or an illusion at first, this sensibility, but as one becomes fine-tuned to the duplicity, to the double speak, one can narrow in on a more lofty paragraph, the more spiritual paragraph, the more symbolic paragraph, and and this this causes a breach of sanity because it causes a breach of rationality. The the measurability of kind of like measuring who who could see a rainbow, measuring all of the space in which a rainbow could be seen would be difficult in a way. It can, it's an imagined rational space. Even though the rainbow is in verb form, it's a rational, logical space that one can conceive of all possible eyes that could engage a rainbow. And yet, even though it's a, a logical, measurable space, I call that rational. So Piro was really trying to home in on me about whether or not I had a distinction between rational, meaning measurement, and reasonable, meaning, you know, something that backed an associative relationship that, that possibly caused something. Um, and I'm just letting him know that he, you know, he didn't have to pry that hard, but that might have been the scotch talking. Uh, but what I'm trying to say about the measurable logical space of somebody that witnesses a rainbow is that the rainbow is also, you know, the rain shower and the light, you know, the sun's relationship to the rain and the humidity may cause an actual person trying to measure who could see a rainbow and who could not see a rainbow. Uh, that would be... Uh, only an approximation at best, I believe. There would be no exactitude, you know, measuring all the people that are behind trees and behind buildings or have their heads turned away. You know, it, it would be an impossibility. Yet, at the same time, I still say irrational. I use the word rational. Yeah. Um... Yeah, so what to say? Um, what to say? You guys can let me know what you think of my abstract. <laughs> it's, uh, 
it, it's come a it's come a long way since I last put it on there, and it's different than it was before. I don't know if I'm liking it as much or or not as much as I did before I did that, but nevertheless. Okay, so yeah, I guess that's what I want to say. 20 minutes. Comments are invited. Um, ciao for now.